Well, Pastor is out today. He is speaking over, uh, he's in town, but he's speaking over at the Embassy Church, uh, which is a dear friend of ours, Brandon Washington, who has spoke here several times. Um, they are celebrating uh, their seventh anniversary, and so he is their um, key speaker today, and so he's there now uh, preaching the Word of God as they celebrate seven years. Amen? Um, they are a very similar church to us. They started in a school, and, and they have to do the tear down, tear up thing and all that. So they're still meeting in a school at this time, so therefore they can only have one service. So Pastor had promised him um, early uh, back in, in last year when he had asked, he had promised him that he would come and speak. So that's where Pastor is today. So you guys get the other half of the Gilbert household today. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So for those of you who don't know me, we are just, I mean, me and Pastor are opposite, okay? <laughs> we are very opposite. We are, we worse than oil and water when it comes to some things, but uh, I love him dearly. I respect him. Um, and I respect what God is doing uh, through him, amen? So this morning, um, we're going to just, you know, I'm going to just talk candidly. Um, you know, I'm not that doctor like he is, you know, there's no slides or nothing like that. Uh, <laughs> but I just want to just speak, you know, from my heart on what God's doing for me, what God is saying through these series of sermons. As you know, pastor's been speaking um, uh, on finances, how we, we manage our money and, and the things that we, we should be doing for, uh, with our money and the things that we aren't doing with our money. Um, he's been talking about doing the right thing when it comes to our finances. And last week he spoke about the, out of Luke, uh, about the three, um, the three men that were given a talent that the manager gave, um, was going out of town and gave a talent to them and told them to invest it so that when he returned, there would be interest gained, there would be money gained on, uh, on his, on his money. And so, uh, we know that he gave it to three. One he gave five. One he gave three, and one he gave one talent. Um, and the, the fifth, the five, the one he gave five, and the one he gave three, went and invested God's money, and they were rewarded. I mean, the money grew interest, and God was pleased with what he did. But there was one who did not invest the money. He decided, you know, it's not mine. I'm gonna dig a hole. I'm gonna bury it. And when God comes back, I'm gonna give it to him because it's I don't own it. It's God's. And I think that's a lot of our attitudes in ministry, in, in life, is that we can become so lax and days ago and so lazy with it that we begin to dig. So I, I kind of, you know, I put my own twist on it. So that, that talent that he buried, that money that he buried, for me, I look at it as an image of God. God has given us his, his spirit. He's given us, he's implanted his imago day. The image of God is within us. But... I bet you a lot of people don't know it because it's dug, we've dug it in so deep that people don't recognize it in us. We're just sitting here waiting for the rapture to come and for Jesus to come back and say, oh, here it is, God, I'm saved, I get to go to heaven. But we're not doing anything to invest in other, li in other people's lives, not really much investing in our own lives. We're just using the gift of God for our own purposes and just waiting for that great celebration but is that what God gave us that for, gave us his image for? And so today I want to talk about doing, what, doing the right thing with our calling, doing the right thing with what God has given us. We just like the, we just like the, the steward have hidden our gifts and talents in God, from, of God in us. A lot of people in here have gifts and talents that would knock our socks off, but we sit in the pew Sunday after Sunday Ah, uh, they're okay. They're good. They looks like they got everything together. And we don't share our gifts and talents on our jobs, in our homes, in our corporate world, in the marketplace, not even in our church, not even in the house of God. And so as many of you know, I have started seminary. I started in August of last year. And I decided to go. I had gone through the training that pastor provides here I've gone through it you know like every time he's done it so I've had <laughs> several several uh, several courses but I decided to go through it when the seminary adopted it because uh, you know they they were giving you a, a certificate um, and it was going to be a much deeper deeper training and so I went through it and <laughs> from the moment I started I was like what is this 50 well I was 57 what are you doing 
why are you in here? Because it was just, it was so challenging, so tough. It really just, you know, began to just shake my world uh, because I don't, I don't like reading. You know, I don't have the disciplines it takes to go through that process. And so, you know, the day of the class, I'm trying to cram homework, trying to do stuff, you know, thinking I'll just ride on Dr. Gilbert's coattail. <laughs> but there was professors that were at the seminary uh, that were coming in to the um, Aurora campus to help us. And so, you know, there was a different level of accountability. I couldn't get away with, you know, <laughs> hey, let me look on your computer. What's the answer to that? You know, I was just, I just had to, I had to do the work for myself. And so as I began, began doing the work, it just became like a, a fire within me. I was like, I really enjoyed, you know, what I was learning. So uh, this spring or last August, I decided to, um, go back to school. Now, I haven't been to school in 33 years. I was at the U of A. I had kids, life happened, everything, and I've always wanted to get, a, you know, get my degree. But I quit because life had taken, gotten so busy for me. And so I thought, you know what? Kids are gone. I'm you know, pretty much free to do what I want to do. I said, I want to you know, take this deeper. And so I signed up and <laughs> went to so I signed up for the for Denver Seminary. I got accepted, and the first day of class, I, my heart was just thumping, thumping, thumping. I was like surrounded with, you know, 20-ish, 30-ish year olds, you know, a bunch of kids. The professor gets up, and it's like I could hear Charlie Brown's teacher, wonk, 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 wonk. And I'm sitting there like I'm trying to write the words down, but I don't know how to spell the words, and I'm just, you know... <laughs> I'm panicking, like, what have I gotten myself into? Like, this is just way over my head. Like, can y'all dumb this down just a little bit for me? And uh, I just sat there with my eyes wide open. I sit in the back with my head down, like, please do not ask me a question. Please don't ask me to respond. And so uh, I just kept pressing through and pressing through. And we studied the image of God. And... Um, when I started reading, I would have to always have a dictionary or have my iPhone right there, and I was just digging up the words, figuring out what they mean. I'm like, why can't they just make that? You know, why do they have to use terms and stuff? Um, and so as I was beginning to just start reading, the thing started sinking in me. It started, it started you know, my, my view of God just started expanding. When I had this little pinhole view of God and creation and redemption and just began to just wake me up, wake up my spirit. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much more to uh, the creation story that, you know, we would never really get to know unless we start digging in deeper into uh, to the pages of history. And so, so the process was that we had to uh, write a paper on the image of God and it was, it was way more than I expected. These are 10 pages, grammatically cor correct, footnotes, all that, citations. And I was like, oh my gosh, am I ever going to make it? But as I, the more I began to read, the more God began to reveal himself to me. And it was like, you know, I told my professor, you know, I, I kind of panicked about the third, the third class. And I met with my professor and I just said, you know, I think I've bitten off more than I can chew. I don't know if I'm going to make it through this posture. And he goes, we hear that from the young people too, so you know, you'll be okay. But as I began to just dig and dig and dig, I just began to see God on a totally different level. God just began to reveal himself to me. I mean, this they had us in, in the um, going through the scrolls. I felt like I was climbing through tombs, and you know, we're just digging all this stuff out about. Um, ancient Israel and, and about the beginning of the world. And it really just began to resonate me, especially since I had went on a trip to Italy and had walked in some of those ancient ruins and those cities. It was like, man, this stuff is real. This is, you know, it's just not pictures that I see, but I've actually been able to walk through those cities and go to the Colosseum and, and walk the streets of Rome. And I'm just like, my God, you know, this, this, isn't just a, this isn't just a story. This is reality. And so as I, 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 I made it through, amen, I got a me in the class. Hallelujah. <laughs> it was tough. It was tough. But I thought, you know, next, this semester, I thought, you know, I'm going to take two easy classes because that one was, you know, you got to be 10-page assignments and all this reading and books and books. So I decided, you know, I really counsel a lot here at the church. I counsel a lot outside of the church, and um, I'd be, I'd, I'm honest, I'd be jacking people up. <laughs> I'd just be like, 
it's like, they say something, I get an attitude, you know, especially if it's a woman, I'd be like, he did what? You know, and, then, and I'm just like, you know, you really need to go and get some, some real theological counseling so that you can reflect back what God would have them to do and not what Katani thinks they should do. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, get my master's in divinity degree. And so uh, I said, but I'm not taking these theological, you have to take the theological classes no matter what. But I thought, you know, I'm just going to take two easy classes this semester and and make my way through. So I took, um, I am in a, currently in a counseling class and then I have a mentoring class because every student has to go through the mentoring process. And so uh, the first day I sat in class, I started crying because I was just like, I thought this was gonna be easy. I thought this class was, you know, you know, just gonna be, you know, a breeze. And uh, everybody said, oh, you know, those are the easy, easy classes. And so I sat in my counseling class on the first day and with a tissue in my hand crying as, she began to explain, you know, what counseling is and, you know, basing it off of scripture and, and basing it off theology. And I'm sitting there like, okay, God, this is the place I need to be. Yeah, I'm going to be able to help people out. And then uh, I went into my mentoring class. Um, and that is they assign someone to walk alongside you through your seminary process. And it's a formation class. And uh, so about week three, I'm like, I'm done with this class. Because what they do is that they dig into your character like none other. I mean, they, they like get a sledgehammer and just start breaking the fallow ground of your heart, your mind, your thinking. And I was just like, you know, I like my stuff. That's mine. That's between me and God. Y'all don't need to know that. But what they do is they, it's like a deep massage of your spirit. And it's like a deep tissue massage. And they just start pushing on my spirit and, and moving stuff and, you know, shuffling stuff and putting a mirror in my face. And I begin to reflect back on what I was. So half the time I, want, I, drive, <laughs> I drive home crying like, God, I'm just the best, which I am. And so um, it really just began to just just permeate my soul as to, you know, God, this is the place that you have me at. This is the place where you're calling me to so that I can be a better Christian. And so this morning, I wanted to share with us, share with everyone, share with you um, what I'm learning. And because I think it is applicable to all of, you know, we, we, we go to church as youngsters or, you know, maybe we didn't go as, as children, but we learn the biblical stories. We learn the Ten Commandments. We learn right from wrong. We know, you know, if the stove is on, don't touch it. It's hot. We learn basic biblical and, and life principles that we grow up with. And that begins to formate our, formate our, formulate our thinking as adults. And so we never really take the time to dig a little deeper than what we know is good, what we know, you know, good morals, good characters. I hear so many people say, you know, I'm going to heaven because I'm good. I'm good to people. I love people. I don't treat anybody wrong. I don't do this. I don't do that. But there's so much more in the scriptures to what God is calling us to. So if I were to ask you the question, and you can just answer it in your mind, what do you do for a living? What do you do? What is your job? What do you do for a living? And I know that I'm getting answers like doctor, I work in the school system, um, I'm a nurse, I'm a CEO of a company, that's what I do for a living. That's really not what you're called to do for a living in scripture. In scripture, you're called to work. You are definitely called to work, but your job is the garden in which God works in. So we're going to look briefly at um, scripture and uh, just understand what does it mean, what does theology of calling mean, and how does that, how do I apply that, how does that apply in my work vocation, in my family, in my, my ministry, you know, what does it mean, because a lot of times we don't know what our ministry is, but I can raise hands, you people would raise hands and say, I don't know what God is calling me to do, but I can guarantee you it is linked to what your passions are and what, what God is calling you to do. So part of, the, part of the thing I had to do in seminary uh, was write a paper on it, which I waited till the ninth hour to write. Um, and uh, so as I was writing it, we had to go into um, all these ancient scrolls and just really read of the ancient, the um, early theologians, Bonhoeffer and Barth and Calvin and Platcher. And, um, you know, it's kind of really rough reading because half the words I didn't know, but, you know, just their thoughts, the way they spoke and everything. But as I began to read, I just began to just, it just began to open up to me that, wow, God, you have been around for a long time, and this world hasn't really changed much, and you're still calling for what you called back then. You're calling for today. So 
I'll just read a few excerpts from my paper. It says, uh, a, theolog a, theolog a theology of calling is linked to the tasks and assignments that are purposed by God to bring glory and fulfillment to what he wants to do in the earth. It is my opinion, <clears throat> my opinion that the term excuse me, theology of calling is not solely restricted to a ministry assignment, but is it applicable to one's professional or non-professional vocation or specific assignment. I believe a theology of calling began at the creation of man, and all mankind has the calling of God upon their lives. The word calling or vocation was not expressly, expressly used in God's creation to Adam to dress and take care of the garden. But the concept of a call as a vocation is clearly implied. Both the Old Testament and New Testament confirm that the truth that God calls people to carry out specific, specific assignments. My son says I always say that wrong, but I, I just can't get it out of my mouth, right? In the Old Testament, we see Abraham being called to be a blessing to the world, while Moses was called to liberate God's people in the New Testament, we find Peter being called as a vessel of the Holy Spirit's witness. And while Paul's calling was to witness to the Gentiles. So this theology of calling um, can be Pacific assignments. These gentlemen had Pacific assignments from God to do certain things. But that's not, they didn't just get saved receive the Imago Dei, and then just became these great men of God. There was a process in which they had to go through. If you look at Paul, you look at Peter, you look at, you know, Paul was the one that was crucifying Christ Christians, putting them to death. He was doing everything against God. But then when God called him, God took that trajectory of his life and used it for his good. So I want you to know that everything that you are doing, the trials, the tribulations, the sufferings, and everything you are doing is because God is trying to get you to the place of your calling. So when we look at Genesis uh, chapter 1 and 26, um, uh, chapter 1 and 26 talks about uh, the narration of creation, but chapter 2 and 15, it reads, The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So my big idea today is, is your calling aligned with God's purpose? If you were to ask, I've asked you, if you were, you know, what, what is your, what is your, what do you do for uh, your job? What, what are you doing? What do you do for a living? We all respond to what we do as a job. The monetary, the, the assignment that gives us a monetary check every week or bi-weekly. We talk about our jobs and our vocations and put them before we put God. I am this. I went to school to do that. I do this. I do that. But God is saying in creation, before I released you into your mother's room, I called you. You came with a specific assignment to do what, I, what, I, what I've called you to do, to be a minister. Now, your calling, your schooling, your job, that is beautiful. Praise God that you are doing that. But when we look at callings and giftings, we tend to label them. So if someone's a CEO, someone's running their own business corporation, someone started a Fortune 500 company, you know, we're like, wow. You know, we elevate them. We elevate them and we think of them more highly than we ought. We, we put them above like they are really doing, they're really having impact on the world. But then you have that, that stay-at-home mom. You have a janitor, you have a, a gardener, you have people who do bus, you know, drive buses and everything. And we think, <laughs> you know, yeah, okay. You know, we, we kind of demean what they're doing. But when God looks at it, God sees it as equal. God sees it. That mother that's staying home with those children and raising those children, she needs to be making the salary of the CEO. Because she, her job, her work is at, at home, formating her, ki her children, teaching her children, pouring into her kids, which is just as a high a call as the CEO. So when we look at our vocations, you know, oftentimes we think, well, you know, I really don't, I never got trained in this or I didn't do that. Your life is your training in everything that you do, whether you're a mom, whether you're a fortune 500 work for a fortune 500 company they are all part of God's plan they are all God's calling so when we look at Adam uh, we see where God you know created Adam placed him in the garden and God told him to work it and keep it Adam had a job before he even got up 
you know, got out of the dirt. He was like, God said, this is what you're going to do? You know, you're going to take care of this garden. You're going you're gonna to serve me in this way. You're going to, you know, be the, be the, the person that, that um, I look to to keep our, my garden in order. Any of us ever tried to grow a garden or have a garden and didn't tend to it? You know how, how monstrous that thing can become. The weeds take over, the caterpillars, the bugs. You know, if you don't continually attend to the garden, the garden can get out of hand. Life can get out of hand. And I think a lot of our gardens have become out of hand. I know for me, mine, um, I'm, I'm de-weeding through seminary and through some other things. But, you know, we have to constantly do a self-check on ourselves and make sure that we are doing what God has called us to do. So for us to be made in God's image, for us to be made in God's image is the most foundational thing, the most fundamental thing about us as human beings. The irreducible factor of who we are is not an add-on, it or does not define us. It is just who we are. The image of God that is in us is the most fundamental be, part of our being. I might be a doctor, I might be a lawyer, I might be a pastor, but before all of that, before I answer, I work at such and so, I am a child of God. I carry the Omago day within me. And so, so many times, though, we get that thing reversed. And we think, this is what I've done. You know, we pull out our accolades, our degrees. Or we, you know, we want people to see us, well, what we've done for ourselves, what we've accomplished, and not see the finished work of God that is in us as Christians. So if we're made in the image, um, in his image, then our vocations should reflect the image of God. And by that I mean... When we go to work tomorrow, when you go to work, you're not just going to work to go to work to get a check, but that's how we live. Work, go home, get up the next morning. We live in this repetitive cycle. But if we begin to think of our jobs as that garden that God has planted for us to live in, for us to work in. When God placed Adam in the garden, God told him, be fruitful. He told Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, take dominion. And so our gardens, whether they're in our homes, in the marketplace, or at our, our place of employment, those are the gardens that God has given us. Amen? It's a place where God has positioned you as his image bearer to go in and, run, and, and rule and reign, to go in and take dominion, to go in and, and be a light, be a source in that place for those um, employees that may be struggling with their faith, may be struggling in their marriage, um, might be having all types of issues going on in your life. You are called by God to work that garden. Amen. So when somebody asks you, you know, what, what, what do you do? You say, I'm working for God. <laughs> my primary job is to, is to work the calling of God upon my life. And so it might be that, you know, you're in, a, in a, uh, an employment situation where you hate your job. Okay, you can't stand your boss. I've been there. Um, you, you know, you just, you just can't stand it. But you're stuck there. Because it's, a, it's monetary. It's a monetary need. When I was younger, I worked at this um, one, um, I was managing one of the drug stores, and our top boss and me, we didn't get along a little bit. I mean, he was just the biggest bully, uh, just always badgering people. And so one day I decided to confront him. Don't ask me why. Um, but I confronted him. And he went, he went up, me, up one, one side and down the other and threatened to fire me. I was like, you can't fire me. And that thing got so volatile that I had to bring in corporate office. I wrote a letter to corporate office about the way he was treating his employees and the way he talked about, you know, everything. So I had all my documentation and everything, and I wasn't expecting them to walk in and hear the, white, the, co the black coats come in, and they call me up to the office, and, you know, we received your letter. And so uh, they, they handed him the letter, and he read it, and, he, you know, his face just, and I was sitting there praying like, oh, God, oh, God, what have I done, what have I done? But I had to stand up for the, I had to stand up for the employees and everyone. So they removed him to another, to another location, and the atmosphere immediately changed. You know, the atmosphere became peaceful. It became an environment where, you know, God reigned. There were a lot of Christians that worked there. And so it was like, whoo, you know, the whole atmosphere changed. And so, you know, I had to be a change maker in that environment. I had to, you know, just, just go out and, and call, call it what it was and say, you know, this is, um, this is racist. Um, it's, it's, 
you're, you're against women. You don't want, you know, you don't want to elevate women into these, these higher positions. And it just became so volatile. But I was like, well, you know what, God? Somebody's got to change this. You know, we were all like 15 years invested. And, and we were like, I'm, I'm not quitting. I'm not leaving, you know, my 401k and everything because of him. And so, you know, there's times when God calls you to make change in your, your, your uh, place of work. It's t- times where God, when you go to work, you're not there to serve. You're there to be of service. Of course you do your job, but you're there to be of service. You're there to be that image. You're there there to, you know, pray for people and and take, you know, take ownership of of these people's souls, especially if you know that they're not saved, if they don't know who God is. You know, you invite them to lunch and you begin to share your faith and begin to say, you know, yeah, I work here and I know, you know, the policies and everything, but, you know, I like to talk talk to you. You know, I, I see you're struggling with this stuff. Those are the places where God wants us to go in the gardens. He wants us to go into those deep places and areas so that we can uh, begin to share his, 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 his DNA, that DNA of the Imago Dei that is within us. So um, God has placed his image in humankind, and the call of faith is the beginning aspect of a, the, of a theology of call, whereas, an image, whereas image bearers, we respond to God's call on our life, and this is, intentional response is the starting point of one's call, but it is of one's call, be it to the vocation or otherwise. God's initial call is one's invitation to join him in his work. Scripture is clear where it states God, God's gifts and callings are irrevocable. While the call is irrevocable, one can resist God. God's call for their life can resist God's call for life, but their resistance does not change his providential intentions for their life. But their resistance does not change it. His providential intention for their life will remain. So, for example, when we look at Adam and God, you know, Adam and Eve decided, you know, hey, we can be like God. They got tempted and they thought they lost track of what they were, they were created to do and decided, you know what, we can be just like God. So they, they wanted to wanted to take God's place. They wanted to be in position with God. And so they ended up sinning and the fall came and we all know that God put them out the garden. Adam got fired straight up. Adam was fired from his job and God placed them out of the garden because of the sin that they had brought into his presence. But God, but Adam's job did not change. Not one bit. The call on his life did not change. It was just more difficult for him to toil the earth. It was more difficult for him to produce the fruit. But God designed him as a person that would, would uh, create you know, beautiful gardens. That he was the beginning of, of the foundation of the earth. And he was to spread out and rule and reign over the whole earth. But Adam decided... He's going to do what he wants to do, like many of us decide when we blatantly hear God's laws, but we think, let me see if I can sneak through this back door. So Adam was fired. Adam was fired from his job, but his call did not change. And so if you've ever been fired, I have been fired from this church probably about three times. <laughs> fired and rehired. Um, and, you know, I've gone through, you know, just I, when I look back at my, my jobs, you know, some of them were difficult. Some of them were nice. Some of them were fun. Um, but when I look back over it, who I am never changed in the jobs. Now, maybe there needed to be some character changes in me, but who I was never changes. Who you are and who God created you to be, it will never change. But you yourself have to make, might need to make some, some character changes. So um, one, of the, one of the things in our class, uh, the, the professor asked us, who is this? This is a, a theologian that uh, wrote... Um, uh, a beautiful statement about Colin Kaepernick when Colin Kaepernick decided to take a knee and stand up for what he believed was injustice. Uh, and then he ended up getting fired from the um, NFL. He lost his job. And so he asked us to guess who the theologian was that, that made the statement. And, it's, and the statement is, we, we confuse the ideal of having a job with fulfilling your purpose. That was Jay-Z. Jay-Z made that statement at, at, during an interview with, uh, with um, some reporters about 
talking about how Colin has lost his platform, that, you know, his, his, his drive and his press, he won't have the platform to speak on injustice. You know, he's lost millions of dollars because he refused to stand up. He refused to, you know, uh, he put his, his passion before his job. And, you know, what, why would he do that? because of the financial um, distraught that it would bring him. And J.C. said, that's just his job. He's working in his calling. He's working in what God purposed him to be. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't about that monetary settlement. It was about what God had convicted him in his heart to do. And so as, as we begin to, to look at our jobs and our vocation, are we compromising? You know, are we compromising for the paycheck? Are we compromising for for the fame what you know we have to make sure that when we know that God has called us to something that we might just need to shift we might just need to move we need to you know make sure that we are always following God's passion over our our desires so when we look at, at scripture um God where God created um we were created to feel God's call on our lives by working man's purpose is to provide spiritual service as the carefully selected word in Genesis 2.15, it means we are to, our, our job is to set rest um, in the garden and to work it and to take care of it. So whatever work we did was therefore described as services to God. And so in our jobs, in our gardens, that we are supposed to go in and we're supposed to set a place of rest, a place where the Holy Spirit can come. You know how God used to come into the garden and speak with Adam and Eve. He found rest there. We're supposed to make our gardens a place of rest. We're supposed to work it. We're supposed to take care of it. We are there to serve God's people through God's heart. And so the fall, I believe the fall has just obscured our view of what work is. You know, we, we think of work as, or we think of ourselves as that fallen man uh, because Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Now we're, we're, we work under the curse of sin and, you know, we just got to go out and we got to work hard to get our money. We got to sweat to get everything we need and everything we want. When God is simply saying, I redeemed all of that. I corrected all of that. When he sent his son Jesus down as our redeemer, as our Lord and our Savior, all of that was corrected. And so we live a life under the fall instead of living life in the hope of what God has in store for us and what he already corrected. God wants us to live like Genesis 1, pre-fall, before where everything was in order, everything was aligned, everything was filtered through God's heart and through God's design and where man was flourishing. God says, you can do that today in your own gardens. You'll be able to do that as you follow the principles of God in your life. So um, when we have our break, when, when we are working, we have to realize that Adam did get removed from his job. See, a vocation is portable. The call is portable. Whatever you've done, maybe you've been fired, maybe you, you know, your term is ended, maybe your contract is ended, that doesn't mean that you're going to leave your degree sitting on the table and go look for another job. That doesn't mean that you know, those years spent in college are going to waste. But your vocations are portable. Um, vocations can be faithfully pursued even if they get significantly repackaged in different roles uh, and different tasks. So as you're, as you're on the trajectory of what has God called me to do, just know that your vacation is portable and everything that you have done in life counts. When we first started the ministry, I was, I was everything. Like I said, I was, you know, janitor, secretary, accounting. I did, you know, there was just so much to be, do, much to be done. And I had a lot of roles. And so even today, now that I, you know, we've grown and there's other people that, that can carry those tasks. Even today, if I pick, pull up to the parking lot and I see a piece of paper, I'm going to stop and pick it up. If I go into the bathroom and it's dirty, I'm going to open up the janitor's closet and take care of it because it's not about me. It's not about, it's not about you know, those things like, oh, we have somebody to do those tasks. No, you saw it, you do it, you clean it up, you pick it up because to me, this is God's house, Amen. This is a place where God resides, and I take pride in making sure that God's house is in order. That, you know, everything, you know, people will walk, you know, people will see trash, and, you know, it's, it's, sometimes I'll just sit in the parking lot, like, did they not see their trash? You know, and I'll go right over by them and pick it up, like, 
I'm taking care of God's kingdom, clink, you know, throw it away. Because that's what God calls us to do. He doesn't want us to get, you know, all lofty like, oh, I'm just too good to do that. I will never be too good to go and scrub a toilet. I will never be, able, I will never be good to not serve the people. Because God has, has taught me through my years how to serve people, how to be humble. And then have to get up, you know, and if, I have, if he calls me to get up and speak, then I can be speaking. I can be humble in my speaking because I don't ever want to think that I've attained anything. It is the spirit of God that is within me. It is the spirit of God that is within you that elevates us to positions. And so as you, if you're on your job and you think, oh, that's, I'm not filing nothing. I, I'm past the filing stage. Go in there and file the papers. Go in there and just do things. Go in there and be a servant to the company because that's what gets the eye of God. That's what gets the eye of the manager is that this person is committed. This person is humble. So God, God will call people to specific tasks. We can see throughout scripture where he has called um, men that did great things, such as Moses. Moses was born, um, and when Moses was born, he was put in a river. He was adopted, and he became the stepson of Pharaoh. Moses did not see the end. Moses was living fat in the palace. Moses was, you know, he was, but he was, at the same time, he was seeing his people being afflicted. But God took Moses from the palace, then he became a fugitive, then he was a shepherd, and then when God was ready for the call, God spoke to him and said, all that you've done in life, all that I've taken through this life is for this moment. You're the one I've chosen to go and free my people. So, you know, you never know what God has for us. There's some Moses that's in here. There's some Davids in here. There's shepherds. You know, you're out there. David was in in the in watching the sheep and having to fight lions and bears and he was working that slingshot never knowing that the call of God on his life was to take down Goliath so whatever you're doing in life don't don't belittle it to think that it's really has nothing to do with anything because if you are walking in the Imago day in the presence of God God is going to pull that out of you God's going to release that and you're going to find yourself being elevated to the place where God can use you and where people will be blessed by what you by your obedience so also in our vocation there's integrity vocational integrity and I'm not gonna lie there's been some jobs that I just clowned on okay you know you just clock in you socialize and you know you doing everything then at the ninth hour you go in and try and cram all your work in um that was me I was you know there were some jobs I was just like oh this is really I can do this in my sleep but God calls us to have vocational integrity. Um, when we are following our vocations and callings in ways that are true to God and how God made us, there's integrity there. So when you walk into your job and you know you clock it in, you clock in on time, but you really don't start work till 30 minutes later after you didn't made your rounds and got your coffee and, you know, did all your thing, went on Facebook, you know, doing all those things. That's not integrity, people. Amen. And I know y'all do it because I do it too. That's not integrity. You are on somebody's time clock. But we do everything that we want. But God's calling us to be, to you know, when we're carrying his image, he says, I want you to walk in integrity. I want you to be the, the example. And so God calls his people to establish um, his identity in us, that we are, uh, we are a reflection of him. And when others see us, and they see us sloughing off at the job, but then we're going to go over and try and witness to them and talk about the goodness of Jesus. When you've been on the phone gossiping with your girlfriend about something, and they didn't overheard it, but then all of a sudden you get this, you know, oh, let me just help you. You've already, you know, you've already voided your voice. You've voided the voice of God because you're not walking in integrity. So it's important for us to walk in integrity on our job because, uh, our vocation uh, must carry integrity. And then our vocation must, must be sustainable. We have to be um, sustainable in um, our relationship with God. Um, even if God moves you, whether it's across country, whether it's a new vacation, or new vocation, or a new assignment that has, he has for you, you have walked in integrity and it's sustainable. The things of God are sustainable in your life. The grace of God is walking with you, and you can walk in there with sustainability, knowing that God's process is, uh, is working in you. So vocational sustainability is when you truly find what you were created to do, your, your vacation is sustainable. If it changes shape, if it changes direction, whatever it does, it's sustainable in you. 
So with that said, as we look at the call of God on our lives um, and the call that God has for his people, and that's you and I, that we have to, to dig some things out of us, dig, dig some things out of us, that buried treasure of the Imago Day that we've put all our issues and problems and sins up on top of that. It's so buried so deep within us that people might not even know that we have a relationship with Christ, that we are Christians. But God is calling for his people to do it in Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, I need to renew your mind. I need to renew your mind. I need to, to transform your life so that you can, can worship me, that you can be that vehicle, that you can be that, that person that, that people come to, that people know and people see God. People want to know how are you making it. People, people are just drawn to you because of the Imago Day that is in, within us. So your call is not exhausted. We are living in the middle of the fall and the redemption. So in our framework and our thinking, we often think of work and the money that it gives. And then we put our families in there and we put all this stuff in between it. And then God is on the bottom of it. God is on the bottom. And what we need to do is that we need to put God first. Amen. He is the sustainer of our soul. He is our monetary. He is the one that gave us the ability to know him, to have an intimate relationship with him. God's working for us, but are we working for God? I was telling first service this morning, I said, you know, if I were God and I, would, you know, if I get tired of y'all, I'd be like, you know what? I ain't working today. Figure out how y'all going to breathe because I'm tired. I'm tired. You know, if God just said, you know what? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm turning everybody into blinded eyes today. Figure out how you're going to do it. Figure out how you're going to hear today. Figure out how you're going to live today. But God is continually at work because of the love that he has for us. I mean, even going to Calvary, dying on that cross for our sins, and we still are just as trifling as we want to be. It's just crazy. Sometimes I'm doing stuff and I'm like, why are you doing this? That's not God. Why, you know, why, why do you continue to play with God like that? I said, he's going to take you one day, you know, like back in the day, I said, I, I'm surprised that I'm standing here today. I'm surprised God, he just said, boop, you done, <laughs> you know, because we just, we just take it for granted. We take the Imago Day for granted, and the Imago Day is the foundation of our souls. It is our life. It is what, what moves us. What, it is our being. And so as we learn, um, to really respect the calls that God has given us, given us, no matter what it is, no matter what level it sits on, God wants his Imago Day to shine through us, that we are here to serve our jobs, our homes, the marketplace, and even in this church. You know, we look around and we're always asking people, can you help with this? You know, we're always trying to recruit volunteers and just, just, because of life, we come in here and we just sit and we just want a word. I'm just, you know, I'm just here to get a word. I'm here to do this. I'm here to do that. When there are so many places in the ministry that your call is needed, that your gifts are needed. If you're a mother and you have children in the children's ministry, guess what? You're called to work in the children's ministry. Not every day, but it is your duty as a mother to go back and make sure that your kids are seeing you with them and that you are teaching them the word of God. When I was here, another, that was another one of my jobs. I was children's pastor for a while, you know, and I was, I didn't mind it because I wanted to be there with the kids. I wanted them to see um, an adult that, that loved God and was teaching them the scriptures and teaching them the verses and, because I don't want them to grow up, you know, knowing it and have a bunch of head knowledge, but not have a heart knowledge of it. You know, so it's important for us to get busy in ministry and to be able to grow this church to what God has called it to be. And we can't do that sitting here and just receiving. But we've got to get up and we've got to serve in our church and serve in our community. We've got to, we got to turn that thing around. We've got to flip it around and understand what God has called us to be. So how do we get back there? How do, you know, you sit there and you say, oh, okay, well, how do I get that back there? And it's first just knowing that you are not that, that sinner. You are not that person, but that you are redeemed. Start living your life in Genesis 1 before the fall, knowing that I have power. I have dominion. I'm here to multiply. I'm here to, to, uh, to give God everything. I'm here to be fruitful. Am I being fruitful? Is my fruit going outside of my house, out of my bank account, out of what I need? What am I doing for God? And God says, let that Imago Day that I put in you 
be first, be the representative, and watch what he does to us. Amen? God bless you. Amen.